Hello everyone, it's been a week and I apologize. It's been a combination, there's been a lot going on in my life. Nothing bad. Um, some professional things going on that, that's, you know, private off to the side stuff that doesn't matter, but it's been uh, affecting my schedule a little bit. I apologize, we should be fine now. Um, the new update, which I was experimenting with, testing, coming to, you know, grips with, grappling with those ideas, the changes, etc. I was experimenting with that. Updating my software across the board, across all my stuff, also affected my ability to connect for obvious reasons. Um, and then yesterday, I thought I was having a problem loading this mic because of these updates, but it turned out it was just my fountain skin, which was the farm fountain skin at the time. It's just preventing me from loading because of poor optimization, I'm assuming. I'm not really sure. Um, either way, that was causing me to crash, and it took me all day to do this by process of elimination to figure out that that was the issue. So, I was planning on coming back yesterday, unfortunately due to the farm fountain skin confusing me for a day, I was unable to achieve that, and I apologize. Now, let's talk about yet another support that heals, and I want to talk about Yemoja because I wanted to just kind of talk about her and get the point here of the healing supports, because she is very interesting due to, as you've probably noticed, she has Omi instead of Mana. Now, any item that gives you Mana converts to a 20% of the equivalent health boost. And what do I mean by that? Because this is actually really poorly explained. The last sentence here, mana, mp5, and mana heals are applied to Yamoda's health pool. This isn't exactly accurate. Let me show you what I mean with the very first item that I build when I play support Yamoja, which is Warflag. I All must be versatile. Right? But I want you to notice, there is no hp5 on Warflag. There is 10 mp5. 20% of 10 is 2. Behold, I have 22 HP 5. That MP 5 is not being converted into max health, it is being converted into HP 5. Let me sell it just to really, um, to really demonstrate. I sell this 20 HP 5, 2686 max health. I buy we Warflag, must adapt. 22 HP 5, 2786. All right, anything that involves mana, is directly converted into health or its equivalent. If you heal, if you would heal mana or otherwise restore mana, you would restore 20% of that much health, which gives healing a particularly interesting facet here, but that's a conversation we'll be having in a little bit. Any increase in maximum mana will increase your maximum health, and anything that increases your MP5 will instead increase your HP5. Now the problem is, is that the conversion is only 20%, which is a really low percentage, so a lot of the times it's not really worth it. These are going to be kind of things that happen on the side. Warflag, for instance, is really partially interesting due to this, in fact. And there are a variety of reasons why I always build Warflag on Yemoja, even if my team comp wouldn't normally support that. First off, Yemoja's auto attacks heal her allies. Okay, this is a significant thing because even if my allies don't need the attack speed, I can use that attack speed to not only hit towers more often, which is a conversation and I'll be, that's a subject I'll be getting into more and more as the video goes on, she's unusually good at it, but not only can I use that for towers in a very unique way, but I can also use that attack speed to heal my allies more and more as time goes on. Right, let me actually give you an example. Now, let's say I... Oh, wait, I forgot I destroyed this for kicks. Let's create a tier 1 just for the example. Now, let's say I happen to be trying to take a tower with a solo lane, right? Rather than me tanking this as Mojo, it's actually you can really extend the damage output on a tower by having a solo laner tank it, and then you shoot through them in the tower. Now, obviously, for very obvious reasons, you're not going to be able to outpace the tower. That's impossible, especially late game. But by healing the solo laner as they tank the damage, that gives you a much, much more extended amount of time for you to, to take the tower, and if your solo laner happens to be someone who relies at least to some extent on auto attacks for their damage, such as Erlang, Shen, Vaman, Gilgamesh, or Bologna are great examples, this solo laner can actually probably 
between War Flag and other attack speed benefits and your healing, they can probably solo most, even Phoenixes, I've had the ability, I've been able to push a solo laner down, you know, with the correct, the correct solo laner, the correct warrior, okay? It's a very interesting strategy that not a whole lot of people, that I haven't seen people really do. I've seen people kind of do this sort of thing with other classes like the Hunter or whatever, but the Emoja is just healing them typically so that they tank the minions, but the Emoja is tanking Tower or Phoenix. But it's actually more effective for a Yamoja with attack speed boosts and a solo laner, ideally with an attack speed reliance of some kind, to just run in, take a Tower or Phoenix with very little problems very difficult to deal with, especially since both of you are going to be tanky. If you get jumped, unless the enemy hunter is there, you're probably going to get away scot-free. Especially when you have the glorious Follow, if you dare. The, the tide, tide calls. which can really make you go nice and quick here, right? You've got all of that, so getting, uh, getting away from enemies with the emoja is not very difficult, especially when I further explain more context of this build, alright? Now, my starting item, besides War Flag, is usually going to be I Sovereignty, must be right? Again, three physical, two magic is the standard, but what if it's not, right? What do I do if the enemy team has an unusually large amount of magic damage? Well, it depends. If I believe the enemy duo lane is double magic, they have a Guardian support and a magic ADC, a mage ADC, right? Or Sylvanas ADC then in that particular instance, if I'm expecting a double magic duo lane, I will go for Heart War. We must adapt. Right. Again, this is this is interesting because that MP5 that you would normally be getting out of Heart War, that is very directly becoming HP5. Same with the War Flag. Now, now is the time I'm going to talk about this. This gives Yamoja an unusually high amount of sustain compared to pretty much anyone else in the game in the support role very specifically, except possibly Kakulin, who we'll talk about in a separate episode down the road. Anyways, due to this and the fact that she doesn't use mana as one would normally use it, she has very unique ways of basically self-sustaining indefinitely, right? Now, in this particular instance, I happen to be level 20. Uh, normally, you'd be level 1. I have, you know, less Omi. You can see the Omi happen as right, 2 Omi increase over the course of 20 levels. It's not really a big deal this way. Uh, and your baseline Omi regeneration is obviously inherently very slow. But, it's very easy to increase that because, oops, key there. Your Omi increases by the amount of cooldown reduction you have, and that's very, very easy to abuse. Behold, once I... Now, I want to actually, before I move on to the third item, I want to briefly mention that I very rarely build Gauntlet of Thieves on her, even with its new quasi-buff, simply because, quite frankly, Yamoja hits hard enough that she accidentally kills a lot of minions. You will find, unless you really restrain yourself, that you're going to have a little bit of a longer time getting these stacks, especially now that they cap at 55. Okay, yes, it means five more protections in the long run, but that's five more stacks until you get to the jump of ten of each protection as an aura. Right? It, I just feel that with the Emoja, it takes too long a lot of the times to get this. So, unless the enemy team has four or five magic damage sources, or you expect a duo, a magic duo lane, a pure magic duo lane, I would recommend Sovereignty, and that's what I'm going to be offering. I must be again, as nice as it might be to have that 20... Uh, the, I'm sorry, it's the 30 MP5 being, you know, converting to HP5. That is literally just 6 HP5. You get more than you get more than quadruple that with Sovereignty. So unless they have just an obscenely large amount of magic damage coming your way, Sovereignty is going to be the better choice here. Now, I'm also choosing Sovereignty for a very specific reason, and again, it does come back to that tower. And this is basically our last sort of concession to towers very specifically, because now we're going to start talking about 
getting you that cool down reduction, all right? Because there are a couple of ways you can really go after that. Now, my very next item, very commonly is... We must adapt. There are a couple of reasons for this. First off, both protection. Second off, a nice jump of 20% cooldown. You can actually see right down there at the bottom, you can see the change in MP5 right down here. It's 1.2 now, and then it becomes 1.5. It's a lovely time. Furthermore, it's incredibly easy to ensure you pop Pridwin on the actual enemies. First off, keep in mind that Riptide is boosting your protections after you go through it, right? That's very important to note, because what I can do is let's, uh, let's grab, um, I'm trying to find some, let's grab one you. Alright. Just going ahead and hit that, of course, even if we wanted to pop it separately anyways, it would be very easy for us to maintain proximity to the to increase our movement speed and our protections. Now, I obviously can't show you that as well as I'd like to because the bot is going to just continuously pursue me, but if you throw your ult out and your, the enemy's first instinct is to run and you want to obviously land that Pridwin explosion, it's incredibly easy to keep pace with them with Riptide. The only exception to this is if they jump over some non-water wall, in which case you're not going to be able to catch up to them because Riptide doesn't go over, he doesn't allow you to go over walls, but as long as they're not jumping over a wall, quite literally, you will be able to catch up to them. Possible exception would be, uh, there are actually, I'm sorry, three other exceptions of people who might be able to outrun you. Wheelish on Suku, Lancelot on his steed, possibly Mercury, if he's built enough movement speed, but other than those three, and again, barring jumping over walls, you will be able to catch up to literally everyone else. Guaranteed. And land that Pridwin explosion, which isn't going to hit too hard right at this point in the game, but that's not the entire reason we're building it. And it is just a really nice slow attached, it is a nice amount of damage you're kind of popping on additionally. If they don't run, that's another round of damage after your ult is finished, because you could actually see it. And that's the really interesting thing here, is... I don't want to reduce my cooldown, I want to reset my cooldown, because if I reduce my cooldown, we're going to have, I'm going to ha not be able to talk as effectively about it later on, which you'll see as this kind of plays out, my, like, which is also an additionally good thing, because you will actually have also noticed, I'll go ahead and reset the cooldown one more time, just so you can see, but you'll also notice a huge spike in my Omi regeneration, is your ability to take care of that. That went up to four only a second. That is huge. I'll really emphasize that a little bit later on, but that is a substantial amount of only regeneration, plus your Pridwin shield keeping you alive. Even if you would normally be in a pinch, throwing that ult out there is very likely going to turn the tides quite literally, pun intended, of that fight, because now you're, you've got a health shield, you're regenerating your Omi, you're blasting abilities out all over the place. The enemies have a health shield that they need to get through, and even when they do get through it, it's going to explode in their face, slowing them and doing some additional damage, which is going to stack with the damage from the ult and the damage of your 50 abilities you're throwing out there. All right, it can get very messy very quickly, and that's what we really want out of Pridwin. So it's going to be the first thing we're going to buy here in most cases. I also like to throw on shoulders. Sorry. Now... MP5, again, we don't really care. We're getting some extra HP5 out of here. You'll notice we're now hitting 51, which is really nice at this point because we're only four items in. But more importantly, it gives us cooldown and attack speed. So here we have this delightful non war flag attack speed. We've already got 1. over 1.5 attack speed here, which is really nice. Plenty of healing for our allies. And again, we've got that nice cooldown. Now comes a really interesting series because this is these four items are what i basically always build on emoja and the last two are fairly flexible um as an example if the enemy team has a lot of auto attackers maybe i throw one to get that last 10 percent cooldown right that's a really lovely time um, but what if instead i am looking more for 
maybe the enemy team has more um, the enemy team has more magic damage I'll grab a I must be versatile. right now keep in mind this is a very important distinction to make Fae Blessed Hoops does not trigger on your auto attacks your auto attacks are not an ability Fae Blessed Hoops only triggers on abilities but it will trigger for literally every proc of Mending Waters have a nice day so not only are you giving your allies a health shield through Mending Waters but each of them is going to get their own custom flower that they will get an additional health shield with. so Fae Blessed Hoops gets very disgusting very quickly all right, this is huge, this is hideous, and this is absolutely glorious. Okay, so it's worth keeping that in mind in case you are going up against a magic heavy comp. In fact, some people prefer Fae Blessed Hoops over Shogun's Kusari. Whether or not I build Fae Blessed Hoops or Shogun's Kusari as my fourth item, that has changed in recent times. Obviously, Fae Blessed Hoops is really incredible. That comes down to your preference. How often do you use your auto attacks to heal your allies? How often do you use your abilities to do so? I'm going to throw out an example here. I personally use Shogun's Kusari because I prefer to heal my allies via my auto attacks, saving my Omi for my first and third abilities. However, say, my mother, who also plays Smite, she's a really big fan of Yemoja. She's better with Yemoja than I am, in fact. Actually, she's better with most healers than I am. Anyways... She prefers to use Mending Waters to heal, so she tends to build Fate Blessed Hoops where I would normally build Shogun's Kusari. So which one of the two you build is going to have to be something you figure out because that's going to depend on how you prefer to heal your allies. Because there's two different methods. If you use a combination of the two, maybe you adjust it according to your team comp. For example, an auto attack heavy team comp, maybe you would lean more on Shogun's Kusari to benefit your allies that way. If it's an ability-based team comp that you have on your side, maybe you go into Fae Blessed Hoops instead. It's really going to come down to how you play Yamoja. But, you know, if, if it's an, uh, an enemy team comp with enough magic damage, I'm going to build both of these. Alright? Just as a matter of fact. But, which one you build as your fourth is going to come down to your personal preference. Uh, sometimes I'll build, if the enemy team composition is particularly squishy, we I'll build Mandible Spike, because newsflash, at least I think they corrected this, let me find out. Yes, they did. So, this triggers a stun, triggers a Mandible Spike. He's got this. Oh, oh, look at that. He's triggered a Mandible Spike. So, Mandible Spike is now suddenly you're having a damage opportunity out of an ability that doesn't actually do damage right and that's very interesting so manticore spike is potentially quite useful again that's being converted to hp5 you but you do get the straight up 300 health which is really nice again i tend to build this against really squishier comps right where i need a bit of both protections because the enemy team is if they're squishier that also means they're doing more damage i get to two convert, you know, my abilities into more damage, which is, you know, nice and effective on the softer enemies because they die a little faster. It's a really lovely time, right? So you do have that as well. Now, there is something else, finally, I want to talk about, and that is a very interesting interaction here. We're going to go on ahead and throw on Witch Blade just versatile. because it's an item I commonly build on her, and it is 40%. It brings me to 40% cooldowns. Okay? Now. Right now, I have 1.9 Omi regeneration. It costs 2 Omi for Bouncing Bubble or Moonstrike. Alright? Now, the whole. Sphinx's Bubble. For me. And this brings my max cooldowns to 50%. This brings my proper cooldowns to 50%. This gives me a bit of magic power I really don't need, and a meager amount of HP 5. But the really big thing is this cooldown, because now, notice I have a 2.2 Omi regeneration. Ha! Not as well. Alright. Now there are ads I have to talk about. I 
I bring this up because you might be the kind of Emojo player, even in the support role, that you really like the first ability. This is primarily to spam the first ability as often as possible, alright? It's only a point three difference in Omi, in the long run. And I'll talk about this more in the solo lane where this gets fairly interesting, but... The downside of this is that it reduces your healing by 20%, including for your auto attacks. So, I wanted to talk about this really quick. When I play support Yamoja, I don't normally build this, but it is something you might personally be very interested in utilizing. Especially since, if you decide you really want to, and this is something that I... I recommend some caution. You, instead of building Sovereignty as your baseline uh, protection item, your physical protection item, you run... We must Resident adapt! Valor, you don't run Shogun's Kusari, or uh, maybe you don't run Pridwin, in fact, even though I'm really fond of Pridwin. Maybe you run Shogun's Kusari, and then afterwards you run... Fade... Oops. You run Fade Blessed Hoops. Maybe afterwards, well, some people are fond of this. Oh, Pythagram's I like this lifesteal, one. and then you want to grab that delicious cooldown for Sphinx's bobble, or maybe you're really spicy. You build into Breastplate of Valor, if you want to shortcut this. Breastplate of Valor, into Fridwin, right into Sphinx's baubles, and now you're running 2.2. Only regen, well, okay, it won't be exactly 2.2 .2 at 4 items in, you'll be about level 12 to 15, so you won't have the full 1.2 baseline, but you'll have 2 plus only regeneration for 5 seconds in 4 items. Again, I don't like this for support emoji because a lot of your, okay, not a lot, but some of your job as a support emoji is going to be healing your allies. Right, I just talked about how you can really use that to create a devastating combo with the right solo laners to take a tower abnormally early. So I don't like Sphinx's baubles when playing support, but you can shortcut this very easily, and then after that you can stack up whatever you want, really. That comes down to your personal preference. But it's just not something I'm very fond of. And another problem with such an early Breastplate of Valor is two things. First off, your allies aren't versatile. getting the protections they need. Now, if it's a magic-heavy comp and you don't need the Sovereignty aura, that makes a little bit more sense. But in most compositions, I find the, l the lack of HP 5 plus the lack of auras for my allies and the reduced health really makes surviving a little bit more difficult. If you're an even safer player than I am, that makes a bit more sense, right? I, I am a already, by default, a bit of a safer support player. But, you know, a item 2 Breastplate of Valor is a little bit too risky for my personal playstyle. Again, you can do it. It does work. Don't get me wrong. I've tested it. I've played with it. I've made it work by basically adjusting my playstyle to be even safer than it normally is. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I do recommend that if you're going to go with a Stage 2 Breastplate of Valor, uh, uh, Breastplate of Valor Item 2, that requires you to play a little safer than you would, because you don't have the HP 5, your allies don't have the physical protections, they'll die slightly quicker, you don't have the HP that you would normally have, instead you have slightly increased Omi regeneration, right? Part of the reason why I like Pridwin is my third item, because I get both protections. I'm not even leaving out the magic protections. I'm getting the 20% cooldowns. I'm getting a nice health shield. I've already explained all the benefits of that. But let's continue on going with where we were talking we about. We must so sorry. Now, let's pretend I'm running Mandacore Spike. A lot of team comps by default I run this against, because again, there tends to be only two tanks on the enemy team, the solo laner and the, su the support. So a lot of the times Manticore Spikes are just very effective for me. And then my very last item, just to give myself the 40% cap, I'll usually build one of the cloaks here. I'm rather fond of the Discord. It really gives me a nice spike in my protections. It's the highest dual protection item in the game currently. Get a nice 10% cooldowns. I get a shock wave that's going to stun enemies if I'm near dying, which is all you need to get a couple of Riptides off, to be honest. So this has saved my life 
an incredibly large amount of times because once that passive pops on Mantle of Discord, if you have the only to Riptide, again, with the th exception of the three assassins I mentioned earlier, you're going to outrun everyone else short of global ults. All right, you're safe. You're fine. This is basically a personal miracle for Yamoja every 110 seconds. So this is a lot of the times. This is generally what I'm building on Yamoja very, very consistently. All right, then we'll finish up, obviously, with a we beautiful war adapt. banner. So we can get more attack speed going on here. We get a nice amount of protection. So notice we have 306 physical. We've got 270 plus magic. We've got 272 magic. It's a really lovely time for our protections. And this is generally baseline where I'm going to be going with this, especially since it's incredibly easy to really mix the enemy up here with all kinds of lovely, fun things here. Stun. This. This. Boom. This. This going on. So, so what? Damage it with Manticore spikes, and you can see not only is Riptide dropping. Um, not only is Riptide dropping Manticore spikes, but if with some practice you can basically play footsie with the enemy for quite a decent amount of time due to them being slower and you're getting increased move speed, you have increased protections, you have the Manticore Spike of course, and you can just absolutely spam your uh, first ability as much as you'd like once you have the Omi. So that, well, I was using one here as an example here, let's use someone a bit spicier. Let's use Ra as an example. Let's go on ahead and actually let's go ahead and start this. about it right I was getting a little fancy with the riptide and because this is a just a computer player running at me I can't even show you some really interesting dodge strats unfortunately the the uh, bots are just straight line going towards you so I can't get creative with it but even without the creativity let me just throw this the tide calls oh, I whipped it You know, again, obviously the Rabat doesn't have any items, so that does change this up a little bit. He doesn't have any penetrations, he has no magic power increases, it's just a baseline default Ra. Terribly boring, nobody likes that. spike after you've already thrown it out and you can reasonably expect it to hit them again and trigger the manticore spike after the fact so that's a really nice fun fact by the way but manticore spike it can be incredibly effective and dangerous on your mojo in a way that it isn't on a lot of other guardians but yeah this is basically a lot of the times how i run support Yamoja. again i will make minor tweaks to manticore's spike Sometimes, typically, it's not Manticore Spike that I'm adjusting mildly, it's Mantle of Discord. Again, if they have an abnormally magic-heavy comp, I'll go Fableist Hoops. Sometimes I'll go Fableist Hoops instead of Shogun's Kusari, but I like Shogun's Kusari as a personal preference. Again, you may prefer Fableist Hoops, depending on your style. And this is just a really lovely time, right? This is generally, again, great for solo laning. But there is an interesting little uh, tidbit, so to speak, that might pique your interest that I can't show you because I don't have a real... Well, I can't show you in this episode, but I'm hoping one day to show you elsewhere. 
Shield regrowth is very interesting for your mojo because of that move speed boost, which stacks with the Riptide. Now, why does that matter? Well, first off, there's a couple of things that you should really know about the Mojo's Riptide. First off, this is a really nice boost of three seconds for your movement speed boost. You know how incredibly easy it is to blitz your way from one lane to another? Basically guaranteeing also your allied ability to be allied with someone if you know you're the tide calls. In lane, you just zip right on over. Find that. Now that was already fast enough, right? rings to traverse the rough equivalent of the Conquest jungle. Now keep in mind that you also get a move speed boost from Warflag, right? Basically, the idea here is your laning ally, be this the ADC or the mid lane, possibly the jungler, if they're in lane at the time, they clear the wave. You now are in possession of a 6% move speed boost from the assist stacks on War Flag. Alright. This is an 8 second buff. Now, you predict a problem in solo lane. They're, you think they're about to get ganked by the enemy jungler. Alright. Throw a Riptide up. Tell your allies, let's go. And down you zip. With a 6% move speed boost from War Flag and a reoccurring 3%, I'm sorry, at this point it would be a 10% boost from Riptide, and unless you've put more points into it, but at that point you probably haven't. 10% boost from Riptide. Boop ba doop ba doop. You're there. Even now, I showed you with the three rings at 30% move speed boost. Scale that back to Conquest map with the benefit of War Flag, it's still going to take you 3-4 rings which you're easily going to be able to afford, you get there, and you're going to think to yourself, well, Professor, the tide is calls. going to take up all your army? Not as much as you think. Deviating the buff camp really quick. And I still have roughly half my omi, now I happen to have the benefit of full cooldowns at this time, but you'd still have enough omi for an ability if you have your ult, and that's not even a concern, because... Behold! Just fury! ...for omi regeneration. <laughs> It's a really absolutely magnificent time. So as long as you have your ult, it doesn't even matter if you're using up your only on the Riptides anyways. So the basic idea is, okay, I've got ult. Oh no. Uh, it looks like an enemy is getting ganked. I'm sorry, an ally is getting ganked. Uh, we've just cleared wave. Let's Riptide on over. Riptide over three, four rings, depending on what stage of the game you're at. Bust out your ult. Only worries are gone. You are now saving your ally's life or avenging them if the gank was successful before you got there somehow. But that is a very quick travel time. And if you have, if you queue with a friend and you're a support main, and your friend plays ADC jungle or mid, you can absolutely make this gross. Alright, take your friend, put him in their favorite role, as long as it's not in solo lane, you tend as a support not to be in solo lane. Grab your friend, throw them in the game, be Moja, and go to town with Riptide ganks. They're gross, alright? The only thing I have to caution you is, make sure you have your ult. It does make a difference. Um, early game, at least. Early to mid game, if you don't have your ult, you're gonna have a really hard time once you get there, because you're only gonna have enough Omi for probably two uses of your first ability, or one use of any other ability. Alright, it, it can get kinda sketchy at the start of that fight for you, with all of those Riptides being used, but... If your ult is up, then that's not a concern, and you can riptide on over with your ally or party members. Just blast people into next week with a surprise riptide gank, alright? It is very effective. There is very, there's, okay, there's, frankly, almost nothing enemies can do about this, for one thing, because, first off, they would have to assume that you're riptiding over there in the first place. Um, and a lot of players, with good reason, don't immediately call missing. They wait until the waves meet. So if you've just cleared a wave and you go into the jungle, unless they're heavily warded, which most people aren't, no one's gonna know. No one's gonna know. They're gonna wait until the waves meet, which of course you've just cleared a wave, so that's not gonna be for a little while. 
by the time the waves meet, you've riptided over to that lane that's in trouble, and you've blasted your ult out already, regenerating that Omi, and generally making life hell for the enemy t team in that lane, okay? It is a surprisingly effective strategy that only Emoja can really do, because she's the only one who can really run that much of a movement speed consist a movement speed boost consistently to not only herself but also her allies without using sprint okay and if you happen to have sprint which i often build on Yumoja, this gets even uglier all right let me grab for you a little sprint now which sprint you use really doesn't matter i as a support obviously i tend to use entangling wings sometimes i'll bust out hastened wings if I have a lot of auto attack focus, I tend to build hastened wings from the solo lane emoja, but let's go on ahead and have this lovely little conversation, right? So what we're gonna do, and I this is generally when I tend to run this. Now obviously we wouldn't be in tank but yet. And that's a really nice speed boost. You'll notice that the wings ended right about the time that I would normally want them to end which is why you usually use them right after the first Riptide. Why don't you use it beforehand? Well, when people do run their wards, when people do ward, they're going to be play putting them right at the intersections adjacent to their lane. So there is the possibility they'll see you on one of their wards. Again, you could still be going for a jungle camp, so they're probably not necessarily calling you missing right away. It's only after a couple of seconds of not seeing you return that they're going to call that. Well, once you get out of standard ward range, blast a riptide out, go through that riptide, pop sprint, you're there before they even get suspicious. Okay? It's a fun time. It's really great. When you see the example episode, I'm hoping I'll have an opportunity to show this to you. It really depends on how that, you know, how that's going to wind up looking in a match. You know what the match actually calls for. But it is something very, very interesting that you can pull off as a stunt, and it catches a lot of enemies off guard. All right. So that's you know a benefit. Now there's some things I want to address really quick before we move on to solo lane emoji because that's a whole separate conversation. I want to very specifically address Rod of Asclepius. Rod of Asclepius is something I do not really build on support emoji. Why? Because a 20% healing boost really does not mean much to her, alright? Now, for Mending Waters, it, it can be a decent amount. Now, you've noticed here that with my current build, the usual way I build her, I have no magic power. That surprises nobody. If you're a long-time viewer, you know I don't tend to build power on supports at, in any stretch of the imagination. Maybe I have one item, but on Yemoja, not today. Anyways, back to the point, I'm rambling. So I have a baseline heal of 130. Well, you know what 20% uh, of that is? 26 HP. 26 HP boost in that healing. Do you care? No. Do I care? Absolutely not. Now, what about my basic attack healing? Right? That winds up being a grand whopping hairy total of 5 HP over 7 seconds. It, it heals them 14 times. 0.5 seconds every 0.5 seconds for 7 seconds, it's 14 5 HP heals. But because it's 14 5 HP heals, that is 20% of the 5. Alright? Which is, you know, 1. So you're healing 6 14 times. You're increasing that healing by a whopping big hairy total of 14 HP. So don't be, don't be fooled by Rod of Asclepius' promises of 20% increased healing. It, it exists, but it's, it's just so insignificant that it's never worth it. It is never worth building Rod of Asclepius on Emoja. Alright, unless you're building wicked high amounts of damage, then that's a different conversation. But if you're playing support Emoja, you're not building wicked amounts of damage. That's a conversation we'll be having in a little bit. Another interesting thing here is Ethereal Staff. I want to show this to you. Come with me on a journey. A gift? Aerial staff journey. For me. Let's grab the mirror just to make it really interesting. 
elegant. Stay alert. A fairly large It's somewhere in the vicinity of like almost 300. Why is that? 6%. I'm sorry, not 6%. 8% maximum mana. Now, this would be... It seems really small here, but again, keep in mind, the Ymir does not have any items. Obviously, in a, in a live match, that Ymir slash support would have items, they would have higher max MP, that would be a higher conversion. But Ethereal Staff does, in fact, give you stupidly large amounts of health, because that 8% mana conversion, that turns into health. Now, granted, it's still only 20% of whatever you would have gotten, so it's still not a lot, but it is a very interesting thing. And I mention this because now we're going to start talking about solo lane Emoja, which is a whole different animal. Now, there are two ways you're going to approach support Emoja. I'm sorry, solo lane Emoja. Now, I, for support Emoja, I pretty much always build War Flag. I, I think the number of times I haven't is I can count on one hand, but with. Solo lane emoji, you've got two really great options. The first is the good old animosity build, and we can really get a lot of interesting things going on with animosity here. What do I mean? Well, I'll talk to you about it. Now, with a Yemoja build in solo lane, you really are only looking at two abilities. Alright, I'm going to reset my level for this really quick. So I want to be increasing my level individually. Now when you run solo lane emoja, obviously bouncing bubble slash moon strike, that's going to be your first. That's going to be your primary. That goes without saying. It's you've got your wave clear basically. Level two. Riptide. Why Riptide? Well, because you're going to have teleport in this particular instance. I'm just gonna bring it up to Persistent Teleport for kicks. You probably wouldn't have it at that level in real life. But because you have Teleport, putting a point into Riptide is actually fairly nice. No, it wouldn't actually be, I'm sorry. I'm having a brain fart. Reset the cooldown. No. trying to see what I'm trying to think of right now is the way I play her is not necessarily I know I'm playing so so lane emoja. No, I'm gonna go ahead and finish out with what I normally do. Now I normally build Riptide as my second ability for a couple of reasons. First off, I can adjust the minion waves with this. Alright. I'm going to actually show you what I mean. There we are. fight a little farther up the lane, which is not necessarily what I normally want to be doing. You can see the uh, difference in my Omi, by the way, my maximum Omi here. out there and you can actually completely change where their front line is. Now this might not seem like a really big deal if you're not a solo main. A lot of solo mains probably just had a heart attack because I can actually relatively aggressively and I can also do the same thing with their back line if I really felt like it. I can push that forward as well. Push or I could push my back line forward. I can basically at will readjust the composition here of these things. And what this means for me is that I can basically control essentially the amount of minion aggro that is going to be easily accessed. If I want to not take the arrow minion damage, right, then when I pop in here for this, I'm going to let the waves meet. Again, again, the animosity damage. I'm sorry, I'm selling it. But then ignore the wave damage. Follow oh, this out yeah, here, and then bring this forward. And then what I'm going to do is shoot these guys with the infinity. And they're going to normal unless I accidentally hit the enemy. Solo lane. Right? Why I'm 
sure that I'm not taking three random arrow pokes. Because when you normally go for the back line of the minion wave, the archers, if you knock them too far out of position, they're going to start shooting you, which may or may not be a problem depending on how much HP you've got, if you have the health advantage, if you have the minion advantage, etc. There's a couple of different things you got to think about if that happens, or if you want it to happen. Let me rephrase that. But because of Riptide, I can basically readjust where those minions are, and I don't have to worry about that if I don't want to. Or, alternatively, if I'm afraid I'm going to lose minion advantage, I may deliberately ensure that those archers are shooting me, not my minions. So that way my minions last a little longer, and I can hopefully then turn that into minion advantage, because now only the enemy's three melee minions are dealing damage to my minions. And as I'm absorbing these you know, pokes from the archers, I'm dealing with them, and the enemy solo laner is dealing with, will soon have to deal with the entirety of the wave by itself, because obviously between the archers mostly dealing with the m melee minions of the enemy team, of the enemy minions, uh, his minions, he's only going to have those three melee minions, and that's all he's going to have. I'm going to have all six of mine, because his three archers are shooting me in the back, right? So, there are ways you can really take advantage of this, especially at level 2, where minions kind of hit a decent bit hard. A lot of the times, what I do for the first wave is cluster them up. Go and waste some homie there. But at level, like, 2, what I'm going to do is go on ahead and throw this the forward. Calls. Very specifically, to cluster them so I can get the best parts of my first <laughs> ability. Right? And then, through that way, after a little while, after I build some form of physical protection, a lot of the times what I'm going to want to be doing is actually making sure that those archers are by themselves. And the way you're going to do that, incidentally, is you're just going to throw this down right here, where you are basically forcing. Goofed because there's multiple of them. You can see where I adjusted the front line, and it, I was a little early on it. But you can force the enemy's melee minions to push forward past your own, and then thereby section them off and deal with them that way. Right. And that is a very effective potential strategy one might use. So at level 2, I typically run... I need to re reduce my level again. At level 2, I typically run Riptide, mostly for that manipulation. Now, the reason I, uh, another reason I don't build Mending Waters as my second ability is because that does not do as much damage as Bouncing Bubble or Moonstrike are going to. Alright. First off, Bouncing Bubble and Moonstrike... It, it, you see here... Let me address this really quickly. Bouncing bubble damage is 40, but that hits potentially two to three times. Minimum one time from your initial bounce, but the second bounce usually hit, you know, it's going to hit the minions, obviously. And then you have the uh, sort of the third Not bounce the there, which will to be popping out even more bubbles, which is just a really lovely time. Even though, yes, I know the fact that these bubbles are doing a percentage less damage, but there's still multiple hits of these bubbles, right? Whereas with Moonstrike, that is 50 for the center ring and 20 besides. And again, using Riptide to cluster those minions the way I want to, the bring the archers forward so they get hit by more, you're actually usually hitting the... When you have the... The wrong key. The second ring there, the second explosion, the internal bubbles, that typically also hits uh, some of the minions in the center ring as well. And you can see when they overlap, they overlap each other, so that overlap is going to cause some minions to get hit basically twice. So you're going to be using these abilities for damage more than Mending Waters. Mending Waters isn't really something you're going to be using at level 2 for damage because Bouncing Bubble and Moonstrike not only consistently do more damage to the minions and enemy gods usually, 
but it also happens to have the benefit of uh, bouncing bubble and moonstrike. Let me rephrase that. Has the benefit of only costing two omi compared to mending waters, which costs three. So, in a realistic scenario in the solo lane, anywhere you would normally want mending waters, you would instead rather have bouncing bubbles. So at level three, I'm sorry, level two, I throw down Riptide because this allows me to manipulate the game to my personal preference and additionally in a pinch I can use it as an escape mechanism. Alright now at level three we're going into Bouncing again. Level four that's where I'm going to usually put one point into Mending Waters just in case the enemy god happens to be something that has say a health shield Ravon, for instance. This also can be a little bit useful later on if they just build. If they build, say, one of my favorite magic protection items, Bulwark of Hope, that's really useful against that. Some people build it, some people don't, but it's nice to have Mending Waters just in case of that. And then the next level, and so you know, I'm just kind of grabbing my ult. Always grab the ult at level 5 for your mojo. And then we're just going to focus more on bouncing bubbles and Moonstrike. Now, at this particular point in time, I'm usually still going to go into Riptide. Alright, why? Again, I want that movement speed boost, I want to be able to rotate. At this particular point, I'm level 8, the potential for a gank exists at this point. If my ult is up, and I'm not really worried about needing to use it to either kill the enemy solo laner, maybe they're playing really safely and I'm not going to get that opportunity or something, I can pop over with the Riptide and either, with just one Riptide, I can proxy, alright? That's just popping, a, basically putting a Riptide in the jungle, bouncing across where their mana is, and then wiping out the minion wave from there, popping back over with a Riptide with any leftover only you might have at that point, alright? And having a movement speed boost on Riptide and a protections boost makes this a little bit easier, because if you have, you know, using the protections boost, you're taking a little less damage from the minions, making the whole prospect of proxying a little safer, not by much, but still. And furthermore, that movement speed is going to ensure you only need the one Riptide to get there in a decently fast fashion. Okay, so that's why I generally tend to increase Riptide in the solo lane over Mending Waters. Again, Mending Waters isn't really useful from a damage perspective, because... Your first ability, as long as you have the Omi casting, why would you want to water and have the first ability? It just doesn't make sense. So, obviously, 9 is the first ability, that's our primary damage. We increase our bolts, and then at this point, we're just basically running a Riptide. Again, for the same reasons, increasing the bolt whenever possible, and then we just go ahead and basically run all the way to. Right? That's usually my why the abilities I pick and why I pick them. You will find very consistently that if you level up mending waters, you probably aren't using it you're not going to use it that much unless you're against very specific opponents. Again, Ravon stands out. He has a passive health shield. I would probably actually devote some points to mending waters against Ravon very specifically, and any other future solo laners that bust out a health shield. Hera, uh, Eset, these come to mind. There's not very many gods that do this, and in fact, the only one that I've consistently seen is Ravon. And I suppose Erlong Shen has a health shield that he consistently brings out. But other than those two, you don't really see a whole lot of health shield in the solo lane. So there are very specific matchups where you want Mending Waters, but those are few and far between. Pretty consistently, I'm building up the first ability, and even then, I'm still preferring to level the first ability over Mending Waters. Mending Waters is just, is just what I level up instead of Riptide, because once they have their health shield, you throw out a single Mending Waters to get rid of that shield, and then you continue on as normal, right? Basically, so you still don't need a ton of points in the Mending Waters, even at that stage. But it's really the only time I specifically build Mending Waters. The rest of the time, you will find more utility out of Riptide. Again, through either maneuvering the minion wave to your advantage, giving you a bit of a either a clearing advantage or a boxing advantage if you can get that minion advantage, too much advantage, or alternatively you can use it to proxy really quickly and a little bit safer. But as for building, again, I talked, I mentioned briefly about the animosity before I went off on the tangent of leveling up. 
this is obviously the auto attack version. You could also go into the um, blood soap shroud, and let me give you an example of what oh, that looks like. I like this one because it triggers once per target per ability. But the fun thing is, is that each of these is typically. Oh. We'll go ahead and use raw for this. Each of these is I think it's going to really demonstrate the amount of damage that you can heal back from better. Get this over there. Now, obviously, we're taking a bit of a bit unusual. She doesn't have items, I only have Blood Soap Shroud. Now, this isn't my favorite. You can see why, obviously. The healing is okay, but it's not going to be goodness gracious this is the most amazing thing ever this was more effective before they changed blood soaked shroud it had physical protections then i don't i i tested this this is one of the things i tested i don't recommend this as much anymore due to that it is nice uh, and it's it's okay generally speaking i am going to recommend animosity in most cases all right, this this is something that I just recently tested, and it's just not the same. The Empiric Shroud, that mana restoration really doesn't amount to really much of anything. It doesn't even amount to a f I think it amounts to like 2 HP, maybe. I, I don't know how they round that. I think it's actually like 1 in some odd, very specifically. But it's, it's really... It was useful when it had physical protections on it, because at least that would give you a slight edge, but now it doesn't have that, so I really don't recommend it. Of course, Sacrificial Shroud is going to just kill you. <laughs> which, again, you're a guardian, which is nice and all, but let's let's grab an item with about a gift? power. You can Amazing. see where the scaling is only like 30-ish percent. Yeah, your ult slaps at like 60% odd. But, actually, I think it's 55% specifically. But... Uh, no, it might be 65%. I think it is. Anyways, you can see where the the percentage here is is not high, right? It's it's about it's a, a, between 30 and 35. I can't do my head math right now. Um, thanks for Thanksgiving. Amen to that. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, absolutely not gonna happen. Um, now, since the update, Animosity is really the option, because it's going to really slap it. Where, where do we go from here, right? And also, you might be wondering, Professor, you don't normally recommend just straight-up building Benevolence. My dear friend, you actually have a decent amount of HP 5 with this. You can see it down here at 32, because that mp5 that is an extra two now it doesn't sound like a whole lot right two whole hp5 oh goodness gracious me look right let's talk about our hp5 now we have a default level one hp5 of 6.7 right we grab it 18.7 that's not bad. All right. We have an absolutely lovely time. Now, where do we go from here, though? Right? What's next on the agenda, Professor? What are we doing? Well, what we do specifically... Now, for reference, it is very interesting where the meta and the solo lane has changed a little bit. Where you don't build a second item nowadays. You build a Chalice of Healing. Bounty. And most people would build multi-potions. I don't obviously build multi-potions on Emoja. Well, I can't say that because actually they are fairly interesting. Multi-potions, let me actually demonstrate to you what this looks like. <laughs> that plus one, by the way, is the healing you would normally get from, um... Back to the Ogun. Oh, you can do better than get that. From there is space for more. On a side of things. So, what this actually looks like in practical application, let me grab Guan Yu because he's actually more likely what you would see here. Oh, 
assault me some. And gently I well, obviously he bodies. too. That is not quite accurate. He obviously be writing potions. But that's what that would look like. So hunt uh, multi potions it sounds counterintuitive, but multi potions are actually more effective on Emoja because she can't heal mana. Alright, so just kind of keep that in mind. But that's the current meta right now, is building Chalice of Healing, multi-potions. I like to bring Teleporter up to stage 2, because it only costs 300, and that is a really substantial 40 second difference in the cooldown of that. And that's huge. You, typically, I don't... I'm short one potion, but for 40 seconds less cooldown on my Teleport, absolutely. But anyways, I'll demonstrate that in due time in a live match. But, you know... What you build is going to depend, and now that the, the um, now that the solo lane meta has has changed, you have this really lovely ability to find out what your laning opponent is before you buy your second item, which is great. Now, what I normally build obviously depends on who my laning opponent is, because basically this devolves into three answers. If your landing opponent is an ability-based physical god, I must be versatile. HP, physical protections, HP five. It's a lovely time. Everyone's happier with sovereignty. But what are the other two options? If the enemy god is literally magic anything, Shogun's Kuzar. You all know why. We've got cooldown for increased Omi regeneration. We have attack speed. We've got magic protections. Again. Everyone loves Shogun's Kusari. What's the third option? Well, if the enemy god is a physical auto-attacker, Erlong Shen, Arachne, whoever, instead, now you might be thinking, ah, you build Witchblade. You can. This is something that I typically build. I typically go into Witchblade. I recommend Witchblade. Again, you are getting that 10% cooldown, you are getting health, you're getting movement speed, which if you're fond of rotating is nice. You reduce enemies' attack speed by 25%, but you can also, if you prefer, go into Midgardian Mail. That's going to be a personal preference thing. Okay? One of the two. If they're an auto-attacking physical god. There's not a huge difference in health, there's not a huge difference in protections. There's 10 more protections and 50 more health on Midgardian Mail. You don't get the cooldown. You don't get the um, you don't get the movement speed boost. This stacks three times for reduction in move and attack speed. I rarely find the movement speed reduction on the guardian mail that useful in the solo lane. But this stacks up to three times for a grand whopping harry total of twenty four percent attack speed reduction. Lo and behold, Witchblade is just a flat twenty five percent all the time, so again I do recommend Witchblade. But if you're just a bigger fan of Midgardian Mail for personal playstyle preferences, go for it. All right. We must adapt. That is entirely up to you. Now, at this point, I still build Prigman as my third item. Basically, Prigman is my default third item for solo or support. Way too useful. Now, I typically go into Prigman here because, again, I want that cooldown. I want that passive. I want both those protections. I know at some point I'm going to be needing magic protections. Again, since Emoji does have so much rotational potential. I can actually often use that magic protections even if my laning opponent and the jungler are physical because I have the option to gank a bit more frequently than my laning opponent. If I pop over with Riptide for a mid lane gank, I don't want to die to the enemy mage just because I don't have magic protections. So Pridwin is still my de facto third item here, okay? Then typically... I must um, be versatile rotating out of the lane, we're going into team fights, I want some dedicated magic protections, I don't know why I have Witchblade here, Sovereignty is very common, right now there's not a whole lot of auto attacking solo laners, they're mostly ability based, at least from my experience the past three days. You're probably noticing other than the change in the starter item, this is looking pretty similar, it is, yeah, Emojis, again, this is fairly common for uh, a lot of my builds for Yamoja, and uh, once again, it's the last two items that really change quite a bit. Now, there are some really interesting things you can do here. A lot of people do like to throw in a tasty Mandacore spike 
I myself am very partial to this. We must adapt. Rather than building, I which I've forgotten to put in here, and I keep forgetting to put it in like I'm supposed to. Instead of mantle discord, which is again something I'm fairly fond of putting in, right? As a support, this is usually where I'd go. Let me offer you a slightly potentially different option. You have two other options as a solo laner. I was having a brain fart. You have two potential different options as a solo laner that you might find helpful. One of these, as I mentioned earlier, is Ethereal Staff. This is a this potentially is a huge increase in your maximum HP, which resultantly oh, will give you I a like really this nice one. spike in your animosity damage. I need to be level 20. Which is a, again, a respectively very nice spike in your animosity damage. This is what I tend to run against tankier compositions, where maybe the jungler is a guardian, for instance. Or maybe their ADC is a warrior. Something like that. They're a, they're a tankier than average composition, and I need a little bit of extra damage to punch through that. I'm either building E staff if I'm behind, or if I'm ahead, I'm running demonic grip. A gift? Very specifically. For me. I'm also more likely to build demonic grip if I have more than one other magic ally. Typically, if I'm playing a solo lane emoja, typically there's still the mage, there's still the support. Usually, demonic grip is a really nice thing. Not always, but usually. But demonic grip, if I'm ahead, is a really potentially nice item if the enemy team is tankier. So just as kind of an aside there. So, basically, whether you build Mantle of Discord or Toxic Blade if you really want, and that's actually something I want to really quickly mention, I, my, if the enemy team heals enough, I'll build Toxic Blade as my last item as a solo laner. If I'm playing the support role and I need anti-healing, I'll typically sell Sovereignty in favor of, and I don't know why this isn't in here either, in favor of Contagion. Now, this seems like it's a really big deal. It really isn't. You lose some HP 5, you lose a little bit of health, you lose very specific, like, 60 max health or something like that. 2% 2 of 250 is 40 and 50. You lose, yeah, literally 50 health. 50 max health reduction, you lose... A majority of the HP 5, obviously the MP5 is converting minorly, I think it turns out to be like 3 MP5s, you're missing 22 HP 5. Uh, but, if I need anti-healing and I don't feel like going with Toxic Blade, I will build Contagion instead. Uh, for solo lane, I'm just going to straight up build Contagion, often if I need anti-healing. The enemy's, my laning opponent is probably part of the reason why. If I'm a support, I'll probably start with Sovereignty anyways, primarily for the sustain and the benefits to my team. And I'll typically then, right about the time, usually by Manticore Spikes about this time, either right before or right after Manticore Spikes, I'll switch to Contagion. It really depends on how the match is going, whether or not I feel I need it. But I will actually sell Sovereignty, but it's too important for me personally a lot of the times mostly for the HP 5 and the protections for my allies for me to build sovereignty at least at start and if it's going well I'll sell that for contagion can you just straight up build contagion instead? sure yeah but you're not going to last as long in the lane you're not going to sustain as much um, if you're more aggressive that might might not be a problem alright I don't play quite as aggressively as some other players do not, not an indictment of aggressive playstyles. It works a lot of the times, if you do it right. But if you're a more aggressive player, Contagion might just be the better option if you recognize, hey, I need anti-healing. And in fact, I probably should be more aggressive. I think I'm, I'm a bit too defensive of a player. I need to be getting more into the habit. I might start building this. I might start forming the habit of building this whenever I do need anti-heal right off the start, so I actually can kind of remind myself, hey, I need to be a bit more aggressive here, right? But just as, uh, and aside on how I deal with anti-healing in the support and solo lanes. So for solo, you can build Toxic Blade as your final item, or you can go back, sell Sovereignty, and go into Contagion, or you can just build Contagion as your second item if your laning opponent is physical. If your laning opponent is magical, you would build Pestilence, obviously. 
So it's going to really depend on that context what you're more comfortable with a lot of the times. But yeah, my build tends to be very similar, but the solo lane has a couple of more interesting options for the last two items. Again, I personally build Manticore Spike as my fifth item in solo lane. You don't have to. Uh, if you really want to go for the E-Staff, or even maybe a Demonic Grip, maybe you're feeling a bit more aggressive, go for it, right? But that that's how I build Emoja in the solo lane. I find that very effective a lot of the times in the solo lane. But now let's talk really quickly about jungling Emoja, because she actually... You probably figured out why, but she's actually very good in the jungling role. Now, when I jungle with the Emoja, you have two basic options. I'm personally very fond of Mannequin Mace because that is 3% health and 5% mana restoration and all of that is in fact going to HP which makes you really difficult to kill in a surprise attack in the jungle because you're going to be surprisingly closer to max HP than a lot of enemies would expect. Furthermore, the burn damage is really nice. Sometimes I will build just plain old um, Eye of the Jungle by no means a bad thing. It really is, again, going to come down to your preference here in starter item. I just happen to really prefer Mannequin Scepter. But again, I have jungle is really nice. If you do go with this, I do recommend going into Protector of the Jungle because you can really abuse the protections here, especially that protection boost in the jungle. You're rip tiding through the jungle, like 12% boost on that as well. It's 30 protections. That's another, like, you're going from 30 to 35 protections, basically. Um, I believe it's 30 the uh, protection boost. It's 40, I'm sorry. Uh, so even better, you're running basically up to 45 protection boost, which is really even better. Um, Seer the Jungle is nice and all, but uh, again, this is a personal preference thing. I just prefer protection the Jungle when I do build this. What, What is my sort of tipping point? How many of the enemy team relies on auto attacks? If they have a lot of auto attackers on their team, the attack speed decrease of Mannequin Scepter is going to serve you really well, especially when you roll into Mannequin Mace in the late game, and Emoja is one of the very few people I will jungle with this, by the way. But this is this is a really impressive amount of reduction on their attack speed in the late game, and that is, that is a 40% attack speed slow at full stacks, right? And that is, again, a 50 flat basic attack damage increase. This is nice and all for, and let me show you why I prefer Mannequin Scepter a lot of the time, even without auto attack speed. Oh, I like this one. We throw out here, right? We have flame minions, buff camps. Right, let's spawn a speed camp for kicks. damage here with auto attack. here, right? And that's with Eye of the Jungle. I should actually I probably get down to that level one. Your arrogance. Let me demonstrate this a bit more effectively. Alright, Scott thoughts. Fuck yes. Right, let's refresh this. Stay alert! Oh, is strong right now? Yeah. So, we have that. Fully acclimated to the fact that we are the one, but let's sell this. Let me demonstrate with Manic Conceptor. No Manic Conceptor, you probably know where this is, how this is going to go. Not as soft as it looks. Now, so <laughs> level, still level 20 level. Um, does respawning this help? But I must. You're still Protect at level 20 them. point here. Anyways, um, since that's apparently having an issue, for whatever unholy reason, uh, I just prefer Mannequin Scepter because that burn damage is going to really help you. That is a just straight up flat 10 increase in your magic, uh, in your auto attacks, right? Whereas if you compare this a to the spike for me. in the magic power, that's only... 39 auto attacks with 20 magic power from 35. This is straight up to 45, 
right? And you can see the difference. But even though we get a bit more attack speed with this, this is just generally speaking going to increase our damage because even though we're not getting the attack speed bonus, we're getting a flat 10 increase instead of an increase of 4. And additionally, we're doing that burn damage, which is going to be even more effective on such things as the jungle games. I was trying to get it to reset, but it's just not going to, which is fine. So, generally speaking, if you are going to jungle with the Emoja, it's better to do it with mannequins after a lot of the time. There are circumstances in which maybe you prefer the Eye of the Jungle, and maybe as a jungler you prefer Eye of the Jungle, and that's totally fine. I prefer Mannequin Scepter because it just deals more damage to camps in the early game. Very, way more effective, um, in my opinion. Now, how do I build out the rest of the time, right? Because that's a whole conversation we need to have. So, generally speaking, when I'm looking to jungle with the Emoja, I am very specifically looking for that attack speed, obviously, right? I have nice abilities and all, but my primary output is in that damage, in that auto attack damage. Let me be a bit more specific there, rather than just throwing a random word of damage out there. Now, typically, a lot of magic jungles build Bancrofts, which we still are going to do here. It's it's just a very interesting thing. So we're gonna oh, run. Oh, I like right? this We're not one. gonna glyph it yet. And then the next thing we usually build is Ring of the Cape. Right, and this is mostly because we want that attack speed. We want the life steal. Now this is where it gets fairly interesting, because you see. It's this particular point. Now there's a very specific reason why I still you probably think to yourself, well, you really don't need a ton of power, right? Because you're still running on the basic idea that you don't have the highest scale. That's 100 percent true. You are absolutely correct. But keep in mind that the ring of the cave is increasing our power by 5%, and this, a gift? this Bancroft talent, For me. is going to increase our attack speed by an equivalent amount. Right. Every so often. So, you see right now, we are getting, what is that, like, like a, yeah, 4% attack speed or something like that? I believe that's what that number is. It's either 4 stacks for 8% up. Yeah. So, we run this, Stack is from that's just each successful basic attack. Yeah, I was correct initially. I got confused. I thought it was gods for a second because it didn't immediately trigger. And I'm like, was I wrong? No, I was not wrong. I was correct. Ring of the Cade just triggers automatically regardless of who you're slapping. So Ring of the Cade is primarily there so we can get late game, obviously, more and more bonus attack speed out of Bancroft. It's actually not about my abilities, it's about my attack speed. Right now, I'm going to sell this really quick because you. I still don't oh, glyph this like even at this, this point. I was just demonstrating why you want Ring of the Kate still. Right? Now comes a very interesting question of how do you prefer to run this, right? Now, me personally, at this point, I'm typically going to be throwing in a delightful demonic grip or possibly hastened ring. When I'm jungling with the emoja, I'm usually going to hastened a ring. Gift? I want that movement speed which is going to help me keep up. I've already got Riptide, of course. I need to be kind of keep putting my points abilities. And Riptide, by the way, is the reason why she's so good at jungling. You clear out. Basically, what happens is here's how this generally works. You run this. You clear the sides out. And you move on to the next one just using. Uh, clean Riptide. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, Professor, you still don't have any Omi for the next camp, but some camps, a lot of the times you're working with someone. For example, the first camp, you're going to throw out a couple of abilities, 
clear that out with the mannequins. You're getting the help of the midliner, and you're moving on to the next camp, whatever you start at, speed or damage, down to your personal preference. But, you know, here we've got this whole delightful thing of, ah, uh, yes. Um, we hit level 2, we get Riptide. It costs Ryomi for Riptide. We're going to go on ahead and blast out maybe two abilities for this camp, and then the rest of the time we're going to finish this off with Mannequin Scepter, get our health back through the healing, Riptide the next one really quick. It's Harpies. It's the two little Harpies. We don't need an ability for those. We just blast those with Mannequin Scepter. Um, blast over to the next camp. It, it's, it's, I'll show you one day in hopefully the near future. There's a process here for this, and it's throwing two abilities, uh, two ver you know, throwing a bubble, throwing a moon strike, finishing the whole thing off with Mannequin Scepter, single Riptide to the next camp. Rinse and repeat. Ally in trouble? Riptide, Riptide, Riptide. You're there. Alt. Blast whoever's bothering said ally in trouble. Back into the jungle. Clear the nearest camp. Riptide. Next camp. Riptide. Next camp. It is... Probably not an accident. There is a very specific flow to this. Okay. Uh, by the designers here. Very effective. But anyways, back to the point of building. Hastened ring, usually. Again, I want that movement speed boost. It really accentuates the... I said that weird. Accentuates the Riptide really nicely. It really makes it difficult to get away from Emoja, obviously. It's already difficult to get away from Emoja. Because she can stop you with the Riptide, which I want to talk to you about really quick at some point in the near future. Um, so that's, you know, something really lovely there. At this particular point, right, my fifth and sixth items, again, this is going to really depend on what your needs are. A lot of the times, oh, I just build the like Grip. This again, one. I want that reduced protections, right, on the enemy. It's a delightful time, even though this does, you know, physical damage, which is fairly interesting, and that has its own utility. But we'll talk about that in the future anyways. Um, we'll talk about that. I won't talk about that today, but we'll talk about that interesting uh, facet one day. And then I usually like to build Rod of Tahuti, and then at this point go into a nice nimble, and then we run this. Right? This is typically how I run this. Now, what are the changes that I make? Now, Demonic Grip is just something that I find very effective. I can see tear through that. Now, let's talk about dealing with enemy gods. We're going to use Thor again. Keep in mind, Thor does not have any items. I'm just going to absolutely blast this guy. Okay. Absolutely unholy. Let's go on ahead and have a conversation about the boy near here. Right, this is a really nice amount of damage on the end of things. I have demonic grip. I don't need demonic grip. Sometimes I don't build this, and the reason why you don't need demonic grip necessarily is because again, the damage from mannequin mace is physical. Which is fairly interesting. So demonic grip isn't necessarily going to be applicable here. I'll build it against tankier compositions because I again I am going to be looking to hit a little harder. I'll build Toxic Blade instead if the enemy team has enough healing, obviously. But sometimes I'll just splash in some some extra protections, or maybe I'll even splash in... Ah, I built all kinds of things here. To be completely honest, I'm trying to remember all the different things I built. Sometimes I built protections, sometimes I built Shogun's Kusari, sometimes I just built... Um, you know, I've adapt. occasionally built this instead. I've occasionally gone into uh, sovereignty, right? Uh, sometimes I built mystical mail. I don't normally build mystical mail on Yamoja because she's not usually that close to the enemy, right? It really depends on how you play her. I don't usually play her in melee range. So for support and solo Yamojas, I never mentioned this, but support and solo Yamojas, I don't build mystical mail. But for a jungle Yamoja, it's a really great time. Come with me, and you'll see. This can be really fascinating. And if you want to play a bit of a tankier jungle, throwing on a Shogun Tusari and a Mystical Man at the very end can give you a surprising amount of tankiness that is going to catch enemies off guard. And I've done that before, and it's surprisingly very effective. Alright, you don't necessarily need Rod of Tahuti. Right? 
you can absolutely go with this. I must Have yourself a lovely time doing this. I mean, let's let's run up against Neat just for the emphasis here. Is that horrifically bad attacks? Okay. Let's run her off. Let's run her off. Again, he's got no items, he's got no penetration, he isn't the old, still doesn't use no damage. And this is just something I've built and I've found very effective. You just throw on some late game protections. Now, why late game protections? Right? That's actually a really good question. Why wouldn't I build these as my second and third items? Very specific. I mean, Mystical Mail would theoretically help against jungle camps then, right? Well, there's a couple of reasons why. First off, you really want to have the power there so you can clear camps and gank effectively, right? That's a really big reason why the damage is first here. All right. Your job as a jungler, well, part of your job as a jungler is to gank enemies that are really causing your allies trouble in their lanes. You can't do that with Mystical Mail, it takes too long. Keep in mind, Mystical Mail's damage scales with your personal level. 20 damage per second is nice and all, but 20 damage, you're, you know, when you're starting to gank, you're probably around level 5, 25 to 30 damage, level 5 through 10, not really a great time. You're also typically going to be ganking people in lanes where there's most of the time going to be two, on average, two enemies, give or take one, depending on whether or not you're counter ganking or whatever one to three enemies in that lane, right? Whereas late game, you're starting to get into the team fights, you're just basically spreading this miasma of death around you in the form of a mystical male busting out 40 magic damage a second, and that can get quite out of control for a lot of enemies. And in fact, if you're really gonna double down on the magic damage here, you might not even want Ring of the Cape. You might want oh, demonic stuff on top I like of all this, this right? Because obviously the mystical male is magic damage. So what you're going to want to do is basically bum rush the enemies in case you just run up on them with your hits and you know, just absolutely decimate them with essentially the chip damage. Death of a thousand attacks, right? It, which doesn't sound like it would be terribly effective and against certain assassin builds that are popular, yeah, it's not. You're, you're not going to necessarily want to solo ability-based assassins. They will destroy you, ability-based assassins very specifically, but you will be able to take out most anything else. It's very odd. You basically are making yourself weak to a specific kind of enemy jungler, but becoming better at dealing with everything else. Supports and solo laners aren't really likely to have the kind of damage output they would need to punch through your protections that you have, especially since most uh, guardians don't build any penetration, and solo laners typically build only 10 to 20 percent penetration on average, which isn't really a whole lot. Hunters, while they do build a lot of penetration in a lot of situations, normally would be the bane of your existence because of the presence of mana conceptor and just the absolutely unholy amounts of auto attacks you're throwing at them. That's not really a concern because you're reducing their attack speed by 30 or 40 percent. I believe it's 30 percent. No, it's 40 percent. You're reducing their attack speed by an entire 40%. That's more than Witchblade is going to give you. Alright. And finally, you're going up against the enemy mage. They're going to be squishy as all get out. Right? Just by baseline. So you're just going to be able, as long as you can dodge their ability, you know, their ult basically is the only concern. Even then, a lot of mages don't build a lot of uh, penetration either. A lot of the times, again, the average there is only 20%. 10% from Rata Tahuti, 10% from either Typhon's Fang, or... What is that other one called? I'm having a brain cramp. Staff of Mirden. Right? They'll typically only be running 10-20% to 20 magic penetration through those items. Not very many mages are building Obsidian Shard. I'm seeing it more and more often now, since they've changed it, but... You know, up until three days ago, that was a rare thing, and it still isn't a common thing to see on mage builds, so... You know, splashing in just one magic protection item is often going to be enough to get you to basically be able to solo them. So really, and again, Mana Conceptor will help you against auto-attack assassins. It's only ability-based assassins because they've got a Heart Seeker. They have Soul Eater. They typically build 
into Boomba's dagger, and if they go into Boomba's spear, that's another 10% penetration. Ability-based assassins just have a lot of good penetration options and build them. Right, so really, with the exception of ability-based assassins, you'll be able to take out whatever else you need. It's a very odd thing. And whether or not I run the protections or I go full 100% damage is actually going to depend on who the jungler is on the enemy team. It is entirely based off of that. I am not kidding. If it's an ability-based jungler on the enemy team, I'm not doing the protection build because they're going to tear right through that and kill me every time. I'm going to be running the damage. I'm going to be running a little bit more lifesteal with Ring of the Kate. I'm going to be banking on being able to out-damage and out-heal them. I'm going to be busting out... Not these three staff, that's been so lame. I'm going to be busting out uh, Telkine's Ring for the extra damage. I'm going to be busting out... I keep doing that. Rado Tahuti, and I'm going to be trying to just basically out-damage them instead because ability-based assassins aren't going to care about those protections. Come back, Thor. And he's not going to have the best we're concerned about. We're going to try to dodge this ability. We're going to gonna blast it with this. That's what I'm going to be able to do. Alright. If the enemy assassin is ability based, if they're an auto attack base, go ham. Get the protections. Slap them around. Make it ugly. Okay? So, but Emoja in the jungle is surprisingly devastating. And I think that's a slept on usage of Emoja. Personally. Um. The final thing I want to mention really quick, just one last thing before I end this obscenely long episode, but that's because she's so much fun to talk about. I used to hate Emoja. In, in some ways, I still do. I miss my mana, to be really honest. I keep forgetting I have Omi. But it is worth talking very you specifically about Emperor's armor, and I wish I could demonstrate this properly. But... Riptide is interesting. Okay? If an enemy is hiding under tower, you can throw a riptide to force them out, first off. Second off, you can use a riptide to force, to kind of keep them away, put it not at the max range, but pushing away from you, and you can force enemies away from their tower while you're attacking it without pulling away aggro from the minions. So, let's spawn some minions. Let's, let's pretend we're attacking this tower. Oh, here comes an enemy god. You can throw out a riptide. Ah, look, without doing any damage to them, I have now forced them away from this tower, and I've been able to continue attacking, and that's going to be three seconds. Because these, these little babies last for three seconds very specifically. So we're going to spawn some in, we're going to go into this tower. Oh, here comes an enemy. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, right? Now I'm out of Omi in this big area because I don't have cooldowns right now, but that's just for attacking towers. If you're actually defending towers, and I'm going to spawn some more minions so I don't get shot while I'm trying to demonstrate this, right? If you're defending a tower and you get an enemy calls. under here with Riptide, usually the max range that pulls them towards you, and you, again, they get hit by this Riptide, they're slow, you throw another Riptide in the direction you're trying to get around it in because they're going to immediately try to move around it. You can basically, with enough Omi regeneration, you can almost, you can, for a very extended period of time, you can force an enemy to stay under there, now under the tower. Now, what's particularly interesting is the Emoja is the only god in the game so far that I am willing to consistently build Emperor's armor late game because Phoenixes with this combination are just disgusting. Towers are nice and all, and I normally recommend an early game Emperor's Armor specifically so you can use it with towers, very specifically. Alright. Yemoja is better at the Phoenix level because you're increasing the Phoenix attack speed and you're forcing them under that Phoenix, but more importantly is the way a lot of Phoenixes are set up in most maps. Think of... Actually, we can return to the lobby for this, because I actually, for this final point of the episode, I don't need to be in here, but I want to show you the maps really quick. I'm not in queue. Get out of my face with that. So, Arena obviously doesn't have phoenixes. In Assault, behold, and you can see them right here. This dot right here is a phoenix, this dot right here is a phoenix, and you have the walls behind them. When people come out of the spawn area of Assault, I'm going to use Assault specifically because this is 
very true of the Conquest Middle Phoenix as well. When people come around that wall, they're usually, usually, hugging that wall really damn close. For some unholy reason, I don't know why, but they really cut that wall. And the rings from Riptide are pretty damn big. When you're just, if you're standing right next to the Phoenix, you can put a Riptide right where that wall ends, and they usually come around the left side. This is true of both Conquest and Assault. They come around the left side of the wall, left from your perspective, put a Riptide there, they have to go even farther around, put another Riptide, cut them off, and by that point you've done a bunch more auto attacks on the tower. If you have minions, they're doing damage to the Phoenix during this time. If you have allies, you're probably or uh, finished the Phoenix off by this point, unless it's really early in the game. And you can force the enemy away from the Phoenix extremely easily thanks to this wall without damaging them and therefore not pulling aggro away from your minions, assuming you have minions. Just like with taking towers with your solo laner, if they're the right solo laner, using your auto attacks to extend their life under that tower, it's the same thing here, but instead minions and you're not pulling that aggro. And it's really terribly interesting for that reason. Alright, again, I used Assault as my primary example, but the mid-Phoenix in Conquest does this as well. There's a wall behind that Phoenix, and most people come around the right-hand side of that wall for whatever reason. I'm sure some people go around... Uh, I'm sorry. Most people come around the left from your perspective. Some people come around the right-hand side, sure, but mo people, by default, go around the left side, because that's the side the minions go on, and people instinctively are using those minions as a defense mechanism. So they tend to go around on that side, and you can just throw some Riptides down, and they can't get to you to prevent you from finishing the Phoenix off. Right? Now, Slash, Slash is not affected by this, which is fine, um, but for the mid lane Phoenix in Conquest, you can do this. And of course, again, Phoenixes are just incredibly devastating with the combination of good old um, Riptide plus the Emperor's Armor, but I just kind of wanted to really quickly lay out why Emperor's Armor is so good on Yamoja a lot of the times. Can you build this as your second item, a la Contagion or Sovereignty? Sure, absolutely. Go for it. It's a fantastic item on Yamoja. It's incredibly devastating. If you think you're going to fall behind, if you think that your team's early game is substantially weaker than the enemy team's early game, but you're angling for that late game, or you're just, you just expect to play under tower a lot of the times. Absolutely. Roll up that Emperor's Armor. In fact, it actually can be really nice in the solo lane as well, if the enemy god is some pain in the ass to deal with um, that's physical, and you just expect to play under tower the whole time, or maybe you accidentally die um, in the first fight or two against the laning opponent and you're falling behind. And you're like, okay, well, I can't box them anymore, so I'm just going to uh, grab Emperor's Armor and play a defensive game. Totally fine. Works fantastic. Um, you'd be stunned how many people forget Emperor's Armor exists and how incredibly devastating it can be to be under tower and then the enemy solo laner gets cocky and dives you and then suddenly they can't get out from under the tower. <laughs> That's a good time. Um, or they stand right at the tower's edge just to prevent you from getting minions, and then you just bust out a surprise Riptide, they're under tower and panicking, and they're taking a bunch of extra shots. It's a lovely time. But it, uh, play around with Emperor's Armor at the very least. It, it's very effective if, if you can get used to using it. it it's a practice thing, All right, basically. It, it takes some practice to be able to pull that off consistently. right? But once you do it that first time, it clicks beautifully, and you're just, ah, oh, yeah. Now, keep in mind there are some gods you can't do this with. Ravon is a standout example because he can kickflip through the Riptides because he's got that CC immunity. There are a handful of other um, gods with usually jumps. This is much less of a concern in the solo lane where very few warriors have consistent jumps. Hell, most um, mages or even a lot of hunters don't have jumps. But this doesn't work against anyone who can jump over it and Ravan, just randomly Ravan in there. Hell is also very difficult to run this, and Chang'a 
all three, Ravon, Chang'a, Hell, they all have abilities that give them the CC immunity they need to just basically run through the ring, so it's not going to work. Everyone else either can jump over it or just dies, basically, right? But keep it in mind um, when you're approaching Emoja. It's, it's the only role that she can play really well that I would recommend you don't build Emperor's Armor in is obviously jungle. But it's worth building in solo lane and it's worth building in support. So just, you know, have a field day with that. And uh, if you like this, please uh, like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me. And uh, yeah, have a great 24 hours. And thank you very much for joining me.